I on? Hello. Ah, good morning, everybody. Welcome. And it is my absolute delight, pleasure, and privilege to... Um, so Claire has been an amazing champion, and I will ask her to introduce herself because she's got a, a big background and particularly focus on what we're interested in today, which is the climate issue. And we all know this is absolutely the most fundamental issue in Davos today and around the world. And for our perspective, and we were just having a little chat about the perspectives one has, whether they're short-term, medium, long. One of the advantages that we have within our 29,000 CEOs is a good chunk of them, the majority, are private, which means we can take a longer-term view. And what we want to do is just share some of these comments, not for the small group of us that are here, but for our 29,000 colleagues around the world. And we have an amazing opportunity with hosting in England the next climate conference, which Claire's going to tell us about, and we're going to ask her how we, in our little capacities, wherever we are in the world, can get involved, engaged, and make a difference. So, Claire, tell us a little bit about Thank your you background. Thank you very much, Morris. Um Am I on? Yes, good morning, everybody. Some, uh, somebody may, well, you probably don't know, I'm, uh, I was Claire Perry, the Energy and Climate Change Minister in the last Cabinet. Um, when I uh, decided to take on the COP role for full time, I basically declined Boris's offer of staying in the Cabinet because I wanted to do this. And I left politics, and it felt like a good opportunity to actually start using my married name, which is O'Neill. So apologies if there's any brand confusion, but often it's a good, <laughs> a good transition. Um, and and uh, it, it's fantastic to be here uh, and actually talking about the COP. And, and I suppose, I don't know how many people have been to the COP. Have I, yes, you've been to the, the Madrid, or were you at Madrid, did you see? Sure. Wonderful. So the COP, so the Conference of the Party, it's a very formal UN process, is essentially the annual climate change negotiations where governments primarily assemble and thrash through a series of <clears throat> treaties and framework conventions, and uh, which are now non-binding, which essentially involve pledges and ambition and a series of negotiations around finance and adaptation and, and all the hugely important things. And um, it's a it's an unbelievably important event. It, you know, people talk about the fraying of multilateralism at the moment. It's incredible that 197 countries plus the EU come together prepared to talk and negotiate about this sort of existential uh, systematic change that we're facing. Having said that, w the other thing that's happened, which is not reflected in the COP, is all this ambition and all this action that is happening outside the national governments. People, there's this rather sweet phrase of the real economy People talk about the real economy agenda. I'm not aware what the fake economy is that supposedly governments are trading in. Um, but the, the contribution of businesses and sectors and the financial sector and cities and states is absolutely immense. And if you look around the room and you look at what's being pledged at the moment, you'll have seen the Larry Fink letter. You'll have seen uh, these big collective corporate pledges that are coming together. You'll have seen Microsoft. It's pretty fair to say that corporate ambition is front-running, in many cases, government ambition. So the plan for this year's COP is to, is to bring those twin tracks together and to keep them together going forward because this opportunity to challenge, to support, to invest uh, is absolutely immense. And so I wanted to set out, I think there's sort of four or five things that I would ask you and your members to do, if I may, Morris, and thank you again for the opportunity to pitch. So many companies are getting on with or flirting with the idea of setting a net zero target at a particular date. Um, the UK was the first industrialised country to set a net zero target for 2050. I was the minister that pulled that through, followed 24 hours later by France, but we still get the prize as being the first. Um, and it's an incredibly important shift from talking about Paris alignment or science-based targets, because there is an awful lot of carbon between one and a half and two degrees between 2049 and 2099, which is essentially the range of Paris alignment. Alignment. If you set yourselves a net zero pathway, landing zone, life becomes a lot easier for us, for us from a strategic point of view because everything you do either has to get to an emissions trajectory of zero or you have to work out a way to offset the carbon. It's a very simplistic, uh, I found, an easy way of doing it. And of course, we set net zero by 2050 is our aim, which is in line with the best available science. Companies are now coming in with 2030, 20, you know, 2045, 2030. 
30 targets, pulling it in, hugely helpful. But the second thing is we don't just want to know what you're going to be doing in 2050. We want to know what you're going to be doing in 2021. So as you plan, as you will all plan, because you're highly um, numerate and focus on numbers primarily, and don't always have to focus on short-term quarterly returns in, the, in this particular group, What's your missions go? What are your missions going to be in 2021, 2025? We need to see that pathway. And what we will do collectively is provide a platform for all of your members to report into. Because we don't know what the corporate baseline is now. How much carbon are we actually talking about when we talk about these corporate plans? And we don't know what the ratchet down is going to be. And I'll bet it's a very rapid ratchet down. And we need to know those numbers because we need to put them into this global hopper. Ultimately, this is quite an easy equation to solve. It's not like the SDGs, which I find amazing, but, you know, 15 goals, very... In, case, in some cases, quite broad targets. This is an equation. CO2 needs to be zero at a point in the future. You can either cut your emissions or take it out, but it has to equal zero in order to hold climate change to one and a half or two degrees. It's quite a simplistic equation. So we will help you with that platform because at the COP, we want to show those numbers and show what the corporate world is delivering. The next thing is to look at your sectors. So I'm sure every one of your members will be a top quartile in terms of ambition. But there will be a whole trail of other organisations in a similar sector who are not in that space. Now, I know you're all competing fiercely, but in some cases, cooperation, particularly around decarbonisation planning, can be hugely helpful. So sectors are now coming together to say, we collectively pledge to be net zero and you can measure those targets. Um, and then think a bit about the power that you have with your supply chains, your customer bases, your distributors. You know, going into a country and saying that all of the energy that you buy will be renewable is a hugely important policy signal for both those companies that are providing energy, but also the, the national government. So your ability to shift the dial with significant changes in your procurement policy or with your customers... Um, is absolutely enormous, and we need to amplify that and make sure that it's captured and basically get you to be as ambitious as possible. So this COP will be about net zero. It'll be about everybody being in. It's not governments go first, corporates. We are all we are all in this together. That's a phrase you'll have heard in the political landscape previously. And the final bit is around the net, the taking the carbon out, because there are some really exciting uh, initiatives emerging around natural solutions for climate recovery we talk uh, about planting trees that's a hugely important part of the mix as is protecting trees as is improving land use and my sense is this is the year where we collectively can pledge some really very ambitious natural climate solutions put them into the cop process put them into this corporate challenge hopper and go forward together that's fantastic, and w I'm very excited about the opportunities here, but one of the quirky things about Davos is that most of the companies that come here are very significant players, and for them, monitoring, reporting is fairly trivial. They have departments that can do this. Yes. One of the difficulties, but they only actually represent a very tiny proportion mm -hmm. of the world economy. Absolutely. So we're in an unusual situation with the YPO, because we sort of straddle, it, there's 29,000 of us as opposed to just 200 of the biggest corporates and things we can get together. And they can, as I say, they have more the wherewithal, the infrastructure to be able to do the type of reporting on carbon that is required mm -hmm. to have that measurability and focus and, and therefore hopefully achievement. The challenges, so even for us, this is our first year in our 68-year history as an organization to be in Davos, and I'm very grateful, our chairman and our, our CEO who and the board who've come and support said, no, we get it. We need, there's a big world, and we don't represent the tiniest companies, that is true, but somewhere in between. And even for us, I think it is a challenge that I'd like to ask yes. what your thoughts is. How do we have the mechanisms, the so that we can actually measure, because if we, if we can't measure it, then certainly those further down the chain who represent a big chunk of the world economy and a big chunk of the emissions will not be able to do so. What are the thoughts that you have about that? 
Thank you. It's an excellent question. And that, so the short answer is that we will collectively help with that. So we being the World Resources Institute, some of the accounting firms who are right now working to aggregate existing pledges and develop very simple open source ways of reporting ambition. And I went back to the past, so I started talking about the power of working together in the sectors I and mean, even as an organization setting out some very clear um, reporting metrics as to what the YPO organization could report in on so we can aggregate it and of course it's not it's often not perfect because we haven't challenged ourselves before as companies to do this but there are very good metrics you'll have heard of the scope one two and three emissions there are these um, these tools and they have to be as light touch and low cost as possible we're not suggesting setting up great you know carbon accounting reporting mechanisms but if I may Maurice um, Mark Carney was my first hire when I became the COP president. Um, he is leading for me the focus on alignment with climate risk and return in the, in the global financial sector. Um, I know uh, not all of your members are needing to access public markets to grow, but what we have seen is increasingly financial institutions know they need to align their own lending and investment uh, portfolios with climate exposure. So the driver will both be top down but also bottom up because financial flows will move to where companies are climate aligned and the premium for not being or the or I guess the cost for not being or the premium for being climate aligned in your operations I think will start to be expressed very quickly. I'm sure you know you have a, a lot of pressure there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders to make this a successful uh, conference, a gathering that will actually deliver some real numbers. But for us, I think particularly, you, you mentioned on it, you just touched on this point that the largest companies have to report and they have a lot of, they have a spotlight on these things and Mark will make it, you know, ratchet that up and do, everyone will do what they can. But one of the things for us is that for those companies and certainly the further down you go in size of company, the less of a spotlight mm. they have. So those incentives, or rather disincentives, mm -hmm. that are being found out and being shamed, are things that apply less mm -hmm. the further down you go. And so the responsibility that is on your shoulders, in a sense, with the governments, is that the legislation has to be, there has to be the stick because the carrot itself is not enough, because it's a very competitive, especially we've got the younger yes. startups, smaller companies who have to be nimble and mm -hmm. have to be a bit more, you know, if you're really big, you're more, you've got the economies of scale, you can protect. We don't have that in, as, you, as you go down the chain. And sort of, some of the companies in, in, in the YPO are, are reasonably large, but as you go, as I say, down in scale, you have a bigger challenge competitively. And just, me standing up and saying, I'm going to do this, but the competitors don't, mm -hmm. it just means that the good guys die quickly and, and, and because they just can't sell their products. <coughs> and so this is where we need that legislative stick. Can I slight, so you're right, and this is not an either or, it's a both and. So clearly governments have to set frameworks and companies to, for companies to respond to. But if I may, there are two really powerful forces that I see very excitingly impacting the sort of companies who are your members. So first of all, there is this growing rise um, of the, uh, the, the sustainably focused consumer. And research suggesting that 70% of consumers want to have a more con you know, sustainable profile, but only 30% know how to do it. And there is immense untapped potential in helping people make those decisions easily. I mean, even though the UK just announced that we were going to have the first carbon reporting on meat substitute products, which people always, anyone I don't know is from the UK, we've all become vegan. Veganuary is like a huge thing. It's very difficult to do. Uh, but, you know, this incredible rise of plant-based solutions, and yet people have no idea that actually that's not the most carbon effective thing to do. But nevertheless, there's this incredible opportunity for companies. And secondly, um, the, uh, the sort of nimbleness that you talk about in your sector, there are amazing opportunities in this space. In the UK, we have 400,000 people now working in the low carbon economy. It's bigger than aerospace. Most of those are SME type companies. They're in data management, they're in low carbon distribution, they're in supply chains for offshore wind, which is a huge growth industry, huge startup opportunities. And 65% of young people want to work 
work for a company that has this at the core of their, uh, their, their corporate values. And this is a real problem. So many of the big companies, particularly in the fossil fuel space, tell me they're having real trouble recruiting. You know, the talent doesn't want to work for those organisations. So as well as the cost, there is this incredible opportunity. And the final thing I will say is, you know, we all. The, I think part of the reason the corporate sector is responding so well is Somehow, the personal interaction with customers and with family and with friends... I mean, you probably get a lot of pressure from your friends and family to just do something. My daughter is a, a, an Extinction Rebellion member uh, on her university campus, and she looks just like me. So from a distance, it's quite, you might imagine I am there with a placard. Um, it's not. It's Eliza. But this incredible upward pressure that we're all feeling and, and the chance to do something about it. And, you know, we all know... You know, it, I believe the science, and I think you know these these old debates we had five years ago about the science. I mean, you know, look at the snowpack in Davos, look at the snow records for Zurich, look at the climate changes that are happening in the UK. Look, at, you know, th this is a an opportunity for us to actually do something completely differently as an economic system, and that creates immense opportunities and growth for all sizes of companies. I think it's fairly well acknowledged that the opportunity set that is there, and most entrepreneurs see that and react very quickly yes. to that kind of uh, incentive. But there is a problem that comes alongside that, which is not all of it is real. And this is the whole issue about greenwashing. And that causes a lot of problems, especially in an international, mm -hmm. we, we have members in uh, 130 <coughs> countries. Now, in the UK, if I were to make claims about my zero emissions in my company mm. that were not true, I suspect there's a regulatory mm. framework for dealing with that, uh, at least if I was found out. In your 197 participants that you will have in the conference, there'll be a lot of those who uh, have entrepreneurs and companies who profess to do things that they're not doing. How do we deal with that? Because that's a, that is a problem, because it's one of the reasons a lot of entrepreneurs say, you know, it's great, you know, tell me to do that, but I know that my competitor isn't. Yeah, they, they, get, they know what you're saying and the consumers and all that, but they're just making claims that aren't true. And, and I think that's that? why, you know, talking about this sense of the, the grand alliance, which only lets, oops, sorry, which only lets in um, those who are genuinely making the difference. So it's, you know, you are not going to be, we're not going to ask you to stand up and be counted unless you're seriously making those pledges with the decarbonisation. But it goes back, I guess, to financial disclosure and reporting. So if you were making fake claims about your profitability, neither your auditor nor your bank would allow that to continue for very long. And ultimately, I think that is where we are rapidly going with this sense of the green taxonomy, the focus on, on you know, actually how do you measure and manage this from an investment portfolio. And this will very rapidly, I think, start to become, I not only know, so we will have mandatory um, financial disclosure report, climate risk disclosure reporting in some big countries by the end of this year. And at the moment, of course, we often exempt small companies because of the regulatory burden. But it's that sense of, you know, because small companies don't, align, don't exempt themselves from all accounting rules because you have to in order to operate. So I think increasingly shining a light on this corporate behaviour and not... Uh, are not sort of permitting greenwashing. So companies saying, we're going to be net zero in 2050, but we're going to be the ones that go last because we're going to let everyone else go first and then suddenly we'll find a way in 2045 to suddenly cut our emissions. That will not cut it in terms of this grand alliance. And by not coming into the grand alliance, the investment community, the 12 trillion, you know, the Larry Figs of the world who write these letters, will rec be recognising that. And, and that will increasingly have a cost. And if I may, you know... The, how is it possible children today can be taking out 45-year mortgages? You know, in the UK, where we have flooding risks, my husband's a professor at Cambridge, my O'Neill husband, uh, we live in a place called Riverside, there's a reason, it floods. You know, the flood, pro the flood projections for Cambridge, I don't really want to own that house in 10 years' time, let alone get a 45-year mortgage. So the, re the retail consequences of not pricing this climate risk into your businesses today are absolutely enormous. And I have a belief that, you know, of course the first duty of governments is to protect the long-term livelihood and safety of their citizens, but politicians tend to focus on electoral cycles. 
businesses where you pull out your calculators and you look at the long-term investment horizon, you make long-term decisions, the climate risk and climate opportunity should be r flashing red in your spreadsheets right now. So it's, I, I trust you all with your calculators, ladies and gentlemen, to be making these good decisions. I, th I think people do. And I'll open this to questions now. But one thing that is I have to challenge you on because it's what is being said, whether it's being said on public or not, but for those smaller companies, they say, oh, we get the calculation, mm -hmm. but somebody else will do it. Mm -hmm. And I know that in my, I won't survive as a business competing with the extra costs. And I know we, we talked about a car costing only another five pounds, I think you said, steel. for green steel. So, I mean, you know, I, I get it, and the bigger companies are <coughs> fine, but we have to reach out the biggest economy is well below the people, not only in Davos generally, but even <coughs> within our membership, well below. And they think about survival day on day. The investigatory powers are gonna be critical. Mm -hmm. The compliance, the, the enforcement issues. Now, I, and, I, and I'll put out there, you know, I'm a Brexiteer, although not, you're not allowed to use that term anymore, Boris doesn't all like it, you know, we're all, we are all Brexiteers. <laughs> but, 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 you know, and part of it is because as an entrepreneur, we don't want that regulation. I know somebody's giving me dirty looks about my, my, my but, but we didn't want all that bureaucrat, bureaucratic uh, rigmarole, and it was really stifling. Um, but if we don't have that in this respect, I fear that a lot of the people at the lower end of the yep. economic, so I just say, this is somebody else's problem, I can't deal with it. How do we deal well, with that? And I, I look, so the free riding principle is always a problem. But but along with free riding goes the kind of tragedy of the commons. I mean, look, can I, I, I don't need want to come over all kind of climate alarmist. I mean, I'm a geographer, but I'm an eco-pragmatist. But, but, you know, let me just share with you. So, so your point about, you know, we who goes first and will I lose some competitive edge? Um, first of all, technology suggests that those who go first tend to reap the advantage from this stuff. So ultimately, those who have established their new supply chains or their new metrics or their new brands tend to reap the reward as the, as the market moves towards them. But, you know, um, since the 1850s, and actually most rapidly in the last 30 years, we have been conducting an uncontrolled chemical experiment with our atmosphere. If you and I went down to Zurich, drove down now, how far is Zurich from here? About 100 and something miles? We would get halfway before we had run out of atmosphere if we were driving straight up. So, so proportionally, this, the atmosphere is as thin as the cornea on your eye. And we have been conducting an uncontrolled chemical experiment with that globally for the last 150 years. And by the way, we talk about this as if there's some historical debt to the big emitters. Over half of emissions have happened since we first convened in Rio to talk about this. So this, and, and this is having, you know, a material impact on all of our lives. Last time CO2 was this high, Morris, sea levels were 20 metres higher. The climate was three degrees higher. Trees were growing on in the Antarctica. We have no understanding of what this potentially could be. And I fear that by, um, you know, of course we need to proceed together. Of course we need to have this combination of regulation and action. But this, as Larry Fink said, is the biggest systemic change in any economy or any corporate's history. And it's not a blip. It's not the financial crisis. We go back to business as usual. We're in a sustained new paradigm. But I think rather than focusing on the fear, which is driving certain people to despair, we have to focus on the opportunity because it's absolutely huge. I mean, how much money was made from the transition to the Industrial Revolution? You know, you don't want to be the guy making buggy whips when you could be making internal combustion engines, only electric ones. So there is this incredible uh, transition, and I feel the opportunity is absolutely immense. But it will take bravery and boldness and long-term vision to go after this and to capture it. And I think that's what is encapsulated in your membership. Well, that is a very inspiring message. And if I may, we can't get from all over the world uh, questions at this point, although I would certainly like to challenge ourselves to think about how we can participate in November in some effective way. But in the meantime, to those that are here, do you have any questions and would you take uh, the mic? Hi, good morning. My name is Darsono Hartono. I'm actually a member in YPO. Indonesia, I'm actually, I'm actually a spouse member. So 12 years ago, I started a business of protecting and restoring forests with the idea of you can do good things for the environment, good things for the people, and make money. 
I think the endeavor took me 12 years, and we are the largest natural climate solution project in the world today. We are producing 7 million tons of credits every year. So finally, we, we show. But when I ask you a question is, you know, carbon offset is a sensitive issue for a lot of people, right? When you say that you need to decarbonize, that means that somebody have to pay me because I'm doing the right thing. And a lot of people don't like that idea. I mean, we've been talking about in COP and all these people. Do you see that the trend is changing? Yes. <laughs> okay, number one. <laughs> but num I think, uh, you know, because people like it or not, I mean, I, I, I've, I've struggled to find buyers for the past 10 years. And suddenly the past two years, people just buying things. So is it sustainable? That means that if that is the case, there's an opportunity to do this business in the future. I mean, we are the only, I'm the, the largest project in the world, but we are still only a few, you know, VCS uh, accreditation. That's number one. Number two, I see like this climate justice movement, like with the Greta Thunberg and everybody. It seems like in COP, they talk to the government, nobody listen. They came to Davos, they talk to business people, they don't listen. How do we break this? I mean, do you, do you see that eventually there might be a movement of a revolution? I, I, I'm, I'm just worried that these, I mean, if they're not being listened to, there, there might be some disrupt, you know, disruption happening in the system. I mean, are we not doing enough to do this? So that's the two questions I have. Credits or offset. So we talked a bit about nature-based solutions, and I think you alluded to, sir, that the, that the incredible decarbonisation power, but also the opportunities to improve soil, to improve water, to provide um, employment. I mean, Ethiopia, I met the ministers in, in Madrid. This is part of their just rural transition. They are providing an income stream for women and girls through this incredible um, billion tree target they've got, planting 350 million trees a day, but crucially making sure they grow and are, and are, are sustained. This, for me, is a massive missing piece. We've been talking about carbon credits for years and we have about seven or eight over the counter markets right now all of which are priced differently all of which have very different um, t's and c's uh, i would like to create a national um, carbon exchange forest exchange if you like and this is one of our plans for cop where we bring together all of the existing instruments and provide a very open and transparent plate trading platform. And we're working very hard to see how we can amplify that at scale, as well as massively ramp up the tree planting targets. People talk about trees as, you know, oh, it's, you know, if we if we increase the world's tree cover by a quarter, and that means also protecting against deforestation, we would suck out two thirds of the existing over, over emissions today. These are, and by the way, who doesn't like planting trees? It's this great sense of presenting something to the future. So I think you should expect to see a lot of focus on that, and we'd love to talk further. Um, on the sort of rebellion point, it is interesting because, you know, the Green Party, who tend to express, are not doing so well in national government elections. They're doing well in some countries, not in others. But the, but the incredible power of 8 million and counting people acting together. So imagine if that group said, we will never buy a fossil fuel vehicle, or we will never buy a car that isn't made of green steel, or we will never fly unless there is a credible offset. Then that starts to be a consumer force for good. So my message to them is understand your power. You know, it may not be through governments because governments also have to make sure they're providing pension facilities to elderly, elderly citizens, whatever it is. You know, you are just one voice, but think about your consumer power and think about what you can do to essentially get the world to serve you. And that, to me, feels like a positive way of expressing uh, those, those desires and ambitions. Um, we got a bit sick of the disruption uh, in the UK. We're going to see a lot more of it. I was terrified that someone was going to super glue themselves to me. Don't take any ideas <laughs> anywhere. I won't be happy. But, you know, it's quite alarming. But people got sick of it because they want to go about their everyday lives. But, you know, most people, you know, if you look at polling now, there is this great sense of all generations wanting to live a, a more sustainable life. They don't just know how. So there was a recent BBC article about how the solutions, the kind of everyday solutions for, you know, um, some of the main culprits of climate change that we talk about, uh, plastics in the ocean, you know, terror when you've got an island the size of Texas in, in, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific. Um, and, they, and it talks about how paper is actually not that much better. And it, uh, it, it, was, it was alarming. And you're just reading this and thinking, well, why are we finding out about this now? And who is responsible? Because 
essentially what we've done is gone one step forward and two step backs. Now, it's great that all of these businesses have switched paper, uh, paper ba plastic bags to paper bags, plastic straws to pa uh, paper and even metal straws, but I think shouldn't it be the business of government to actually be testing these things that are going to be rolled out across the world before they are actually rolled out across the world? We wouldn't do that with pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So with solutions that are supposed to be protecting the world, shouldn't we have a little bit more culpability in, in, uh, in, in that process and making sure that these solutions are tested before they get rolled out? It's a great point. And you know, in the UK, I mean, obviously, we had extensive consultations over, over two things that we did. One was which was um, looking at deposit schemes for actually bringing back uh, plastic for recycling. I mean, the, the, the challenge is, is, of course, it's waste. And you're quite right that in this great desire to reduce plastics waste, we've made some packaging decisions or demanded packaging decisions that are not necessarily lower carbon or indeed, um, you know, much better in the long term for the environment. Um, but there is a there's a lot of best practice out there. So there is a mix to be to be had. And some of the best economies are a long way ahead of us. And so understanding what they are doing and learning. But also I don't know if I was here from the sort of Ellen MacArthur Foundation, that sense of, you know, the circular economy, that actually thinking a bit about every product that you make, how do we reuse it? How do we break down? My favourite is how many my father passed away before Christmas. We threw all of his small electricals in the tip. That felt bad that we were chucking away perfectly workable appliances because nobody wanted them. There has to be a better way, I think, of making use of materials, particularly those that are based on dwindling um, or more expensive or more carbon expensive stocks. So, you know, the, and again, the best corporates are challenging themselves and trying crucially to get the price premium out because ultimately, as a consumer facing organization, people are super price sensitive. So, what are the technologies we need to develop this circularity at lower cost? And yes, of course government needs to be involved but remember I mean you I'd love to think that governments were as rational as you suggested <laughs> Go governments are often very subject to public opinions as well so when you have you know a hundred thousand people writing or a million people putting petitions and writing to MP saying you must ban cotton buds governments kind of respond to that stuff so it, it's um Again, I, 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 wouldn't, I don't think anyone is the oracle on these things, but we shouldn't be afraid to kind of talk about it. And, um, and also, we just need to use less stuff. You know, reusability, whether it's plastic or glass. It, and by the way, I compost my paper bags, so I don't know what all the fuss is about, but I know I might be in a minority in that. Unfortunately for companies, being uh, telling people to buy less stuff. I know. <laughs> So this big consumer trend of people consuming less is, is you know, we're certainly seeing it in the retail figures in the UK. I mean, every, I, don't, I, I don't know about retail businesses, I detect a trend to buy less stuff. So working with that, working out how you can sell them better stuff and have them pay more is probably the, the place to go. Question over here. Yes, hi, my name is Alan Shetrit from Washington, D.C. And I was wondering if there were quantifiable <coughs> consequences of uh, the U.S. pulling out of the major alli alliances. Yes, it's a great question. Thank you for asking, Alan. Um, so America's Pledge, which is a very good organization who has basically worked to aggregate all of the ongoing CO2 reduction efforts from cities, states, and corporates, have quantified that if we had full federal government leadership, uh, the CO2's decarbonisation pathway, forgive me if I'm slightly, it's something like minus 47% from its baseline by 20, 30, no, minus 57%. Without federal government leadership, just relying on those partners in the America's Pledge, it's minus 47%. So yes, the federal government leadership adds a 10% kicker. But if you think that um, the states of New York uh, and California, if we added them up, would be members of, well, one would be a G7, one would be a G20 member, and they have both passed net zero legislation and are both working very hard to decarbonise. I think we just have to keep relying on that incredible energy that is coming out of the sort of corporates and the subnational actors and hope that one day um, the jobs creation opportunities from this transformation will be something that the federal government starts to realise. Um, Vladislava Magalieska, I'm a vice president of the, one of the biggest uh, investment fund, American investment fund, uh, but on the emerging markets. Mm -hmm. We invested a lot in gas upstream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
uh, more than 250 million during the last year. Um, but as well, I'm a member of the supervisory board in UNIDA, United Nations in Vienna. And recently we invested in the project uh, supported by Euro Commission. It's solar gaps, it's a solar blinds that generates uh, energy. And I've heard that the European Investment Bank changed the strategy uh, to be fully clean tech. In case you know about this, could you please tell several words about this new strategy of the European Investment Bank and may maybe they're working with you? Yes, so you're seeing, um, again, uh, governments and investment banks and multilateral development banks increasingly pledging um, a pathway away from fossil fuels. Now, the UK government just announced, yes, I think yesterday, that we would no longer support any form of thermal coal generation with any of our export finance or overseas development assistance. And others have gone further and essentially saying that they will no longer support fossil fuels, including oil and gas. There is a very big debate about the transition. And it's one that I, as a former energy minister in a highly gas-dependent economy, am quite, you know, conflicted on, if I may say, because it is quite obvious that asking economies to go from 100% fossil fuel energy generation to 100% renewables, where renewables is 6% of energy, is a transition that is m enormous. And in fact, Germany has just pledged to have no coal-fired power generation by 2038. They had to work out a very big transitional financing package to do that. We in the UK will have no coal by 2025. So there is a, a, a rate of change, I think, that needs to happen, um, moving away, particularly from coal. If, if the world could do one thing, it would be to make coal history. Coal is the most polluting fossil fuel, and it has extraordinarily disbenefits in terms of air quality, health problems, etc. We just need to leave the stuff in the ground and look for cleaner transition pathways. Um, but it's much disputed, as you'll know, and, and you'll see that a lot of the pressure that's being expressed on the big oil and gas companies is now we don't want your sponsorship money, we don't want you to be involved, um, is I think amplifying that desire for them to go further and faster, particularly in their um, diversification plans. Um, but for me, uh, gas has proved an extremely helpful transition fuel in the UK economy. And we have now gone, as I say, from 40% coal generation in 2010 to about 2% now, and it'll be zero by 2025. And that's been gas plus renewables that has allowed us to do that. I think you're expecting this question, but you have a very, and I think it's very brave, this whole idea of changing the negotiation mm. strategy in the conference to be open in front of cameras in the light of day. Will people negotiate effectively in that circumstance or will it just be theater? Well, I don't know. And we had a lot of arguments when, before I was elected about cameras in Parliament, didn't we? That, you know, the UK Parliament should never be televised because we needed to have our meeting room where we, you know, shouted at each other like school children. Um, I was uh, very struck by two things. One is if you sit in the, not all, but many of the big negotiation plenary sessions, it... Uh, the level of disconnect between what is being discussed and what the world thinks is being discussed, who we are there representing, is quite large. Um, and also that countries do already play to the camera. There isn't a camera there, so countries will stand up and they will say exactly the same play, but they have always said, with great validity, but it is not, not questioned by the world because people don't see it. So my sense is, you know, there was a great line that David Cameron used to use. I don't think it was his originally, which was um, sunlight is a great disinfectant. Transparency is hugely important. So what I'm aiming to do uh, is live stream the negotiations. The UN Security Council meets in public, for goodness sakes. We have in, you know, in, ca in camera conversations about, you know, who's going to bomb who <laughs> or not bomb who. Um, and so my plan is to, to live stream all but the most intense and informal negotiations. And we will see. We will see if things change. Well, in the spirit of that open negotiation, as an organization that represents the smaller end of the spectrum in respect to companies, in these climate conferences, you will always have the representation of the biggest companies because they're there to do their lobbying. How do we participate? And I'm speaking, we've got our CEO and 
past chair here who was just thinking, we, we have no plan and there's no, but, but it would be very right. interesting to see what we can do together because it occurs to me that although actually even beneath us is an even bigger economy, but even for our little tranche, which is about, we, we ourselves are about nine trillion, so after America and China, we, we'd be the third largest economy, but beneath us is a much bigger economy even. How do we participate right. in that? So, um, a couple of bits of homework, if I may. So, challenge your members as to who is uh, working in the net zero space and what their plans are. Offer to help them aggregate up those numbers, so you actually bring a YPO number, perhaps, rather than asking them all individually. And as I say, we can we can work with you on who are the WRI, some of the accounting firms who are aggregating these numbers, and then amplify your voices around the space you know get involved in the debate what get involved locally or get involved nationally with what's happening and i think make the case for the positive economic opportunity from this transition um, so you're actually you know selling the story of this of this sustainable transition rather than just doing what people often do which is look in the rear view mirror and focus on the risk but we'd love to help you be part of that grand alliance collectively and have your voices heard, it sounds like, for the first time very loudly at COP26. Well, that's a great challenge to us. Uh, we have to take that home and do it. Uh, the challenge back to you will be that you will hear that voice. <laughs> and what we will have to do also perhaps is throw out another challenge. We've got this one trillion trees yes. and maybe all of us can have our employees planting yes. trees. I don't know, we'll have to think of some ideas, but this has been a wonderful, inspirational start to this important topic for us in this conference and thank you thank for you. all of your time and for all that you're doing and we wish you the very best of thank luck. You.